Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and of death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross. O my people, holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, leave us not to bitter death. O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, all my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have conquered all your foes, and you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. For I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people. Holy Lord, God. Holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, allow us not to lose hope in the face of death and hell. O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, all my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people, is this how you thank your God? O oh, my people. Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, Holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, keep us steadfast in the true faith. O Lord, 
have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death on the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first word. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Do you know what makes the difference between Jesus and us? Do you want to easily see the distinction between God and human beings? It's in these words of Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You and I find it so easy to cling to grudges for ages. Everyone who would laugh if we spoke of it, of the things that we held grudges for. It could be a passing statement about how bad our new glasses look or someone telling us that we didn't know what we were talking about, but we simply like to hold grudges for years. But now look at Jesus, God of God, very God of very God. Here he is, suffering the most cruel injustice of all time. Jesus is being put to death, yet he was innocent of all things. He was beaten, mocked, ridiculed, Yet he only came to bring God's grace and forgiveness. Yet here there were foreign soldiers doing the work of the religious leaders, driving nails into Jesus. And his only response, Father, forgive. What beautiful words. And they are spoken for you and for me. They are spoken when we have intentionally or unintentionally sinned against our neighbors and have given them reason to hold grudges. Father, forgive. It was spoken for the way that we push aside the hearing of the word and make decisions based solely on our own pleasures and nothing on God's will. Father, forgive. Our sins are covered. They are away from God's sight. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do.
the second word. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. His attitude was horrible. He was hanging on the cross, nameless and guilty. He, along with his buddy, deserved to be there. They committed high crimes. They could have murdered some fellow Jews, or maybe they had started a rebellion against the hated Romans as they lived in their cities. But he deserved to be there. And yet, in the midst of all of that, he found the strength to ridicule Jesus. Something changed over the hours, though. Perhaps the man knew the stories of Jesus preaching and his healings and his miracles, and now he was seeing Jesus up close and personal. He had heard Jesus cry out in pain, Father, forgive them. Whatever the reason was, the man changed, and suddenly he defended Jesus from the mocking of the other thief. We deserve to be here. He doesn't. Lay off, he cried. And then with changed heart, touched by the gospel of Christ, the man gasped at Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Today, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. This is the the promise of the gospel in a nutshell. Sins are forgiven, heaven's gates are open, and faith finds its goal in being with Jesus eternally. We all face the challenge of death. We're surrounded by it now in our community. And while it may not be from the COVID-19, death will come. Sinners die. But Jesus made this promise. To those who trust in him, they will have eternal life. Therefore, we need not fear death. The promise has been made on the cross. With sins forgiven and with faith in this Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. The third word. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. What a funny thing for Jesus to worry about on the cross. Here Jesus was hanging, suffering from pain, suffering because God was pouring out all of his anger and his wrath upon him. The religious leaders were mocking him with the words of scriptures, the very words that Jesus himself had brought into being, the very word that he was fulfilling. And what was Jesus doing? He was being concerned for his mother. Now, this is important for us to remember today as well. 
Some people live and act as it is impossible to be godly-minded people and, cannot be, and they think we cannot be concerned with the day-to-day -day happenings. That we are lifted out of the mundane things of this life once we are God's children. But here, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, reminds us that the godly person cares for all the gifts of God. Oh, yes, we are concerned about hearing the word. That's what we've been called to do. We're concerned about praying and worship. That is what the Christian does. But the godly person remembers all the gifts that God has given him. The godly person has their feet firmly planted on the earth. And what happens? Well, we take care of aging parents. We help people who are under forced quarantine. We help the young mother who is overwhelmed with her children after her husband has abandoned her. For this is the fulfillment of the law. This is what Jesus did. Behold your son. Man, behold your mother. Friends, Behold your neighbors for whom Christ died. The fourth word. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And at about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabagathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is nothing worse than the feeling of abandonment. I have felt that way at times in my life, and it was horrible. You feel that everyone is against you, and that there are no allies nearby. And even at those moments, God seems to be far away, nowhere near, that your prayers are falling on deaf ears. And in those moments, there's nowhere to turn. At least to that is the way we feel. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus wasn't just voicing some words in order to say to us, I know how you feel, I can imagine it. No, Jesus was truly abandoned. The biggest sign of God's anger is wrath, and wrath is when he withdraws his presence, when he leaves. Without God present, there can be no godly peace, no godly contentment, no godly assurance, for God would not be present. And Jesus suffered that living hell for us. Jesus experienced God turning his back on him. Jesus didn't deserve it to know. But here he was, the spotless Lamb of God. No sin of his own clung to him. No guilt of his own clung to him. No, this was all for us. Our sin clung to Jesus. Our misplaced priorities and the things of this world, food and sports and recreation, our guilt clung to Jesus. And so he was abandoned by God. Now, my friends in Jesus, we have great comfort we walk in faith, never having to fear that God has turned his back on us. We never fear that God has abandoned us. 
For if God did not spare his own son, will he not be with us in all of our troubles? We live today surrounded by fears. The biggest, of course, is COVID-19 this day. But we live with fears of being alone. We live with fears of pain. We live thinking God might not see. But God will never abandon his people. Indeed, he cannot. For Jesus died to take away that wrath. No, we look to the cross, and yes, we see the horror of our sin. But then we look at the cross again, and we see that the promise of God is for us and with us. The fifth word. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. I thirst. What a strange thing for John to record. Jesus' other sayings from the cross seem to be deeper, more profound, more spiritual. On the other hand, this does sound like something a dying man would say. For crucifixion is a slow strangulation. And in Greek, this is a simply one word. A word that you can imagine being gasped by someone breathing hard. Through his mouth for hours. But still, so strange. But something else is lurking here. Jesus or John gives us the clue to why this word is so important. John says that Jesus uttered, I thirst, in order to fulfill the scriptures. So much that seems random in Jesus' crucifixion is anything but random. Jesus thirsts, and he is in control of the situation, and he is going to fulfill every last prophecy that is necessary. Jesus is the victim, it is true. Yet Jesus is in control. He is the king of the Jews. He is beloved by his father. He could come down from the cross as the mockers encouraged him to do. But yet Jesus stayed and thirsted and died for us. Jesus was in control. And Jesus is in control of all things, even this day. I thirst reminds us of that. The sixth word. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. 
I remember saying that when I turned in the final form of my master's thesis. I had had five or six different drafts. I had years of hard work, much critique, some good, some negative, and a whole lot of worry. But now it was over. I didn't have to sweat anymore. I was finished. It is finished means something substantially more when Jesus says it. Jesus' suffering was over, would never be experienced again. God's anger over all the sin of the past was spent. Even more impressively, all of God's anger until now and into the future has been spilt, poured out over Jesus. Think about that. It was not only the sin of the previous 3,000 or more years which Jesus suffered for, it was also your sin and my sin, all for which God was justifiably angry. But no, his anger was over. We walk now by faith, not by sight. Jesus said, it is finished. Your sins are paid for. God's anger and wrath have been turned away. Walk in peace. Walk in joy. It is finished. So take heart, my friends. It is finished. Christ's work is done. His salvation has been given to us. And we can rest assured that we who are the children of God through faith in this Jesus have no reason to worry. God is our Father who, who is in heaven. And he desires nothing more than to pour out his love, his compassion, his care, his fullest blessings, and bring us to his side in heaven. Rest well. Be at peace. Jesus suffered. It is finished. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit to my spirit. And that, having said this, he breathed his last. These are truly remarkable words, aren't they? Every other saying of Jesus was filled with agony. He was thirsty. He borne the anger of wrath, and, and it was finished. He was concerned for his mother. He forgave sins and comforted a troubled conscience. But now Jesus committed his spirit, his life into the hands of the one who rained his anger upon this innocent Jesus. And still, this is a voice of peace. Father, you will take care of me. Father, you will vindicate me. Father, I am your son and you love me. See, Jesus never lost sight of his father, despite all the appearances and feelings. What comfort this is. We too, through faith, are sons and daughters of the Almighty God. We are sisters and brothers of Jesus through faith. We have the same comfort of knowing in our lives, through good times and bad, through pandemics and the occasional illness, through joy and sadness, of knowing that our lives are in his hands. Do we worry about physical needs and illness? Jesus reminds us that today has enough worry, so don't worry about tomorrow. God will provide. Worried about heaven? Hoping you will make it? Don't worry. For God, who has begun this good work in us, 
will bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are in God's loving care. We can rest. We belong to our Father in heaven through faith. And we pray with Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. Amen. We thank all our members who have faithfully been giving through these weeks, and we pray that you will remember us in the future as well. We thank you and invite those as well who are listening, who are, who are our members, to also remember the church and school here with their offerings. You can do that electronically. If you go to our home page and our website, stjohnfraser.org, you will find a link there that can explain the options and how to do it. We pray the litany at this time. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us, help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crass and the assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit to the Comforter, help us, good Lord. In all times of tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord, to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to bring them in holy living to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring them into the way of truth, all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send fruitful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand, and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to give all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help those who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, who protect and guide all who travel, 
to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 